writers record many difficult sayings of Jesus within the pages of their texts. His analogies for the kingdom of God, his parables in response to questions, and his Sermon on the Mount all call us not only to engage our minds, but to retune our hearts. Although the words of Jesus are often difficult to hear, they reveal the truth of God for our lives. These teachings of Jesus invite us into a higher life, challenging our status quo. Will we have eyes to see and ears to hear? Well, I had a slight moment of panic first service I got up here to preach, and I haven't been up here for a little while, and uh, opened up my iPad, and I thought, well, that text sure is awfully small, and, uh, you know, kind of scooted the iPad back a little bit, and I'm, you know, I mean, it's not a secret that I'm getting a little bit older, but I had to blow the text up a little bit to read it today, so uh, thankfully that's taken care of, Uh, but, you know, I, I didn't think that that much would change in like 10 weeks, but... Goodness, I guess it has. So, um, uh, you know, sometimes we have to do some housekeeping, right? And so before I, before I preach today, I want to do just a little housekeeping with you. I want to just kind of give you an update. Uh, we are going on 10 months without a youth pastor here at Lima Community Church. Can you believe it's been that long ago since Pastor Phil and Melanie uh, headed over to Mount Sterling? Uh, still here on our district. We're still in close touch with them. They're doing great. And, um, you know, just such, such fond memories and great friendship with them. And, uh, and we're so happy for them. And, and we know that that left a void here. And I want to just speak to those of you who are parents of teenagers and just tell you, first of all, that there are, um, there are good things happening in our youth ministry still. We've got a great interim leader who's helping uh, lead the way there and, um, and other staff folks who are just providing a tremendous amount of stability and support to that ministry. And so um, if your teens have opted out for this season, I just invite you to maybe encourage them to come back and give it another shot. And, um, you know, we, uh, we're, you know, just because we don't have a full-time youth pastor now doesn't mean the ministry stops. There's still good things happening. So I want to inform you of that and just give you a little update. You know, in these 10 months, we have had uh, several conversations, several promising candidates that we have talked to about the position. Um, In many ways, the church is facing some of the same challenges as the rest of the world these days. It's kind of hard to, uh, to find the right people for the right jobs. You know, every restaurant has their now hiring signs out, right? And um, the, the way that, that the church is facing that challenge is very different than restaurants, obviously, but um, it is still a weird time to be hiring for full-time ministry positions. And so we're just working through those, um, those challenges and trying to navigate that as well as we can. We're in the midst of conversations with two candidates right now that we feel are, um, you know, we've got hope for, and we don't know what exactly is going to happen with those, but we would invite your prayers and um, just your thoughts on, uh, you know, those kind of issues as we continue in those conversations. But uh, in light of just a couple conversations I had this past week, I, I realized that we needed to give you that update. We haven't done a great job of communicating with you about that. So just want to let you know that that's where we're at. Okay. So I mentioned that I haven't been up here for a little while. I got back from sabbatical, sabbatical just about a month ago, and this is my first chance to preach since then. And before I, uh, before I dive in, I want to just say a couple words of thanks. I want to thank our church board for, uh, for having a sabbatical policy for our staff. Um, it's, um, you know, it's just uh, a great... Uh, it's, it's a very humbling thing, and I'm grateful for the generosity that the church board showed to my family and me, and the fact that they have that policy in place for our pastors um, is something that I just greatly appreciate. And so I, I just want to, I've, I've thanked them privately, but I want to just thank them publicly in front of all of you. And I also want to thank our staff. Um, you know, when the executive pastor takes a nine-week break, everybody picks up a little something, and some people pick up a lot of something, I'm sure. And um, I'm just so thankful. The staff never made me feel guilty for being gone for that time. They were uh, just so willing to provide that, that help and that support, and I'm really grateful to all of them. So for you staff members in here, wherever you might be, uh, please just accept my 
most heartfelt thanks for your willingness to pick up the slack while I was away. Okay, I'm going to, um, so I did some housekeeping and I did some thank yous, and I'm going to do a little seminary class. It's just going to be like five minutes, and then I'm going to preach. Is that okay? Okay, so we're going to kick things off a little differently today. We're going to, I'm going to put um, a couple of verses up here. We're going to start with one verse from 1 John that I want you to look at with me up on the screen. This verse says, all who hate a brother or sister are murderers, and you know that murderers do not have eternal life abiding in them. This is a verse right out of the New Testament. I haven't done anything funny with it. It's from the New Revised Standard Version, and this is just what it says, and it makes a lot of sense. If you hate your brother or sister, it says in 1 John, you're a murderer and you do not have eternal life abiding in you. And now we're going to put another verse up here from the New Testament. This one's from the Gospel of Luke. Uh, It's a direct quote from Jesus. It says, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself cannot be my disciple. So just, just take a look at those two verses. All who hate a brother or sister are murderers. Whoever does not hate their brother and sister cannot be my disciple. Hmm. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar. I, uh, I know enough to be dangerous. I know enough to, to be able to get my Greek New Testament and like look at these two verses and at least figure out if, the same, if they've got the same word in them. Because what I was curious about as I thought about this this week was whether it's a different Greek word, right? That we just... We just translate both of them the same. And do you know what I found out? It's not a different Greek word. It's the same Greek word too, the word that's translated as hate. It's the same word. So there's no funny business. There's no weird like translation issues, anything like that. What we've got is just exactly what you see. We've got a verse of scripture that says, if you hate your brother or sister, you cannot inherit eternal life. And we've got a verse of scripture that says, if you don't hate your brother or sister, you cannot be the disciple of Jesus. What do we do? What do we do at a time like this, right? So that's why I want to start today with a little mini seminary class. I want to start with uh, just some thoughts on interpreting scripture. So I want to say that if you have decided to take every word of scripture every word of the Bible to be literally true, then you've got a problem at a time like this. And there are other times when you would have a problem as well, because the Bible sometimes seems to contradict itself. It sometimes has these things that that don't seem like they can go together. How can this book, inspired by the Spirit of God, have these mutually exclusive things in it? How can it say these things that cannot both be true? I mean, both of those things, they, they can't be true, can they? Well, they, they can't be true if you have decided that every word of the Bible is literally true and requires no interpretation. So um, let me just talk to you about the Bible for a minute. Most of us carry our Bibles around as a single book, right? We've just got a book that is a Bible, and it's, it's a book. It's one book. It's a bunch of pages that's bound between a front cover and a back cover. And besides the fact that, so like my Bible has a, a black, like fake leather cover, right? Um, and, the, and besides that, and the fact that the pages are really thin, it's pretty much like any other book. It has all the same qualities of a book. I mean, it's just a book. The Bible is is a book, and I think that that's part of the problem. That's maybe the start of the problem that we have with our interpretation issues, is that the Bible is not really just one book. The Bible is a collection of books. It's a collection of books written by different authors at different periods of time to different groups of people for different purposes, and it's written in languages that we don't speak. And there's a lot of variables there that complicate things when it comes to the Word of God. So the the Bible is not just one book. Uh, 
but putting all of those different books together into into one book makes it really convenient for us because we can carry God's word around with us. And that's a wonderful thing, but it also makes it really hard for us to remember that the Bible is more like a library than a book. It's more like a big collection of different types of books. So I want you to just consider with me the different types of literature that are present in your Bible, in my Bible, okay? There are books of poetry in the Bible. There are books that are, that are written poetically. There are personal letters in the Bible. There's letters from one person to one other person that are in the Bible. There's letters from one person to a group of people, to a, a church, right, in your Bible. Um, there are books of biography that tell the story of someone's life. There's books of prophecy that, that condense a message that God has for a particular group of people in a particular context and record those messages. There's the Gospels, which are the narratives that tell the story of Jesus. There are books that teach us how to lament, teach us how to grieve, and books that teach us about history that are historical in nature. And there's other types of literature besides that in your Bible. And, you know, it's really easy for us to think uh, that if we go to the library and, and we go to one section of the library and pick up a book of poetry and we go to another section of the library and pick up a biography, we understand that we would read those books very differently, that they were written for different purposes, that the book of poetry is not trying to communicate all the historical truth of the biography, and the biography is not trying to write in a powerful, beautiful, flowery, poetic language like the book of poetry might be trying to do. And in, in those two books, they very likely have the same English word that's used for different reasons. They mean something different based on the type of literature that you're reading, the purposes of the author who wrote that literature. And the exact same thing is true of the Bible. I believe that the Bible tells an overarching narrative. I don't want to downplay that. It is, it is a unified story of God's faithfulness to his people from generation to generation. That is the story of the Bible. But it tells that story in many different ways, through many different avenues. And all of the literature that tells that story should not be read in the same way, just like we would not read a book of poetry and a book of history like they're written for the same reason. So there is a, like, I don't know, a five or six minute um, seminary lesson on interpreting Scripture. And I was thinking this week as I prepared that I probably should not make a habit of saying things that may upset some of you and then trying to preach. But that's what I'm going to try to do this week. So if you're very terribly upset with me about telling you not to take every word of the Bible to be literally true, don't throw anything. Just schedule a meeting with me and let's talk about it. I'd love to talk to you more about um, why this is what we believe about Scripture. But hey, now let's preach, all right? So today we're continuing in our series, Ears to Hear. And as you heard in the bumper, the, the, um, the idea of these messages is that we are wrestling with some of the difficult sayings of Jesus, some of the things that Jesus said that are hard for us to understand. And this is one of those sayings today. What do we do when Jesus tells us to hate our family members? Well, let's see if we can dig in a little bit more and find out what he was saying. So let's look at, at Luke 14, 25 through 27. Now, large crowds were traveling with him, it says, and he turned and said to them, whoever comes to you and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now remember, when you read God's word, always ask the first important question. What do we know about the context of this passage? And I would say that with this particular story today, there are two things contextually that I want to draw out 
and identify and, and just talk briefly about each one of those. So first of all is um, the, the fact that this story very abruptly follows a seemingly unrelated story is something that we should pay attention to. So the story that precedes this one is the parable of the great banquet. It's a story of, uh, that, that Jesus tells of a time when there was a, a guy who wanted to host a party and he invited to his party the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind and made them the guests of honor at the party. Now, Luke, as he is, as he is constructing this narrative, Luke has not taken Communication 101. And he does not use like a transition or a segue. He just has this abrupt ending of the story of the great banquet. And then he dives right into this story that we're reading today about uh, what Jesus says to the large crowds around him. And as far as we can tell, there's nothing that ties these two stories together uh, time-wise. There's nothing that's obvious to us about kind of the way that the stories are put together. And any time that happens when you're reading your Bible, the question you ought to ask is, are these two stories that seem to not have anything to do with each other trying to convey the same message? Are they trying to communicate the same thing? And that is what's happening in these two stories. The message that ties them together is the message of a surprising unexpected upside-down kingdom that Jesus so regularly discusses in his ministry, right? The, the first shall be last, Jesus says. If, if you imagine somebody in first century Palestine walking into a room and there being a group of people in the room and one person is washing the feet of all those people, who do they think is the leader? I, and, and probably the better question is, who do they think is not the leader? They definitely don't think the leader is the person who's washing the feet, right? Jesus is, he has spent his entire life in ministry preaching that the kingdom he is bringing it will not look like the kingdom that the world knows about. And the parable of the great banquet teaches that the kingdom of God is evaluated using different criteria than the kingdoms of this world. And that's the same message of the story that we're reading today. It teaches that same truth. So that's one piece of context is how these stories go together that don't seem like they go together. The second piece of context is, uh, is that we know Jesus during this time is continuing his journey to Jerusalem. Jesus is walking this road to Jerusalem. And during the time that he has been on this journey, his movement is gaining momentum. It's gaining steam. There are uh, people who have witnessed his miracles or who have heard of the healings that he has done. And more and more people are being impacted by his ministry and the following that Jesus has is growing. So look at verse 25 with me again. It says, at the very beginning, now large crowds were traveling with him. There's excitement building about what Jesus is up to. And, and let's just pause for a minute and acknowledge that when Jesus is up to something, we ought to be excited about it. We ought to, we ought to be trying to find out what Jesus is up to and, and pouring momentum and excitement into that and joining him in that work. And so there's excitement building about what Jesus is up to, but, but Jesus has some doubts about the motivation of the people who have gathered around him. And I think that what Jesus is concerned about is a bandwagon mentality. So are you familiar with the bandwagon? You know what the bandwagon is. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to illustrate it for you using a baseball illustration because that's what holy preachers do. Um, uh, we're right in the postseason, you know, and my, my beloved Cardinals made it to the postseason um, again. Uh, sorry to all of you other fans of teams like the Reds and the Cubs that are at home watching the postseason. Okay, sorry. I'm, I'm getting off on a little bit of a tangent, but the Cardinals made the postseason, and sadly, of course, their postseason's already over because they got dispatched by the mighty Dodgers in one game. But during that game, during the wild card game, a friend of mine who is a Reds fan texted me, and he said, uh, tonight, 
for the first time in my life, I'm rooting for the Cardinals because the Dodgers deserve a kick in the, and I'll just let you use your imagination where you thought he thinks they deserve a kick, right? So, uh, so what Brandon was saying to me in this text that he sent was that tonight I am on the Cardinals bandwagon. And you know what I said? Welcome aboard, man. I mean, we'll take all the help we can get right now. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough for us to defeat the, the Dodgers. But, uh, but Brandon was getting on the Cardinals bandwagon. And Jesus is looking at this big crowd around him. And he realizes that he has to find out whether they are truly committed. He has to find out if they are willing to go the distance with him. He, Jesus does not want bandwagon fans. Because do you know what happens to bandwagon fans? Bandwagon fans aren't in it for the long haul. Bandwagon fans, they jump on when everything's going great and the team's doing really good. But as soon as things get rough, they're out of there. They jump off the bandwagon and they go look for another one with more momentum, right? Jesus does not want bandwagon fans because they don't last when things get tough. And Jesus knows that things are about to get tough. Jesus knows what is around the corner. And so Jesus spends the rest of this passage explaining to them exactly what it means to truly be his disciple. Now, the crowds of people following Jesus, they thought he was on his way to Jerusalem to establish a powerful earthly kingdom, to, to overthrow those in power. The people that were around him were saying, we have been the oppressed for too long, and Jesus is going to take us to Jerusalem, and we will become the oppressor. We will put other people under our thumb like we've been under their thumbs, and we'll finally be the ones with the power and the authority and the land and the riches. We will finally be the ones to come to power. They were pumped up about what was happening with Jesus because of what they thought was coming in Jerusalem. And you know what came in Jerusalem? We know what happened when Jesus got to Jerusalem, right? Jesus picked up a cross and he carried it to his crucifixion. He died the most humiliating public death reserved for the worst criminals of that day. See, the, the kingdom that Jesus had come to bring was not what they expected it to be. And in this story, Jesus understands these people, this large crowd around him, if they realized what it would cost to follow them, they wouldn't be quite so excited. He realizes their, their excitement is outweighing the serious task, the significant work, and the great risk that lay ahead for them. And so with that backdrop, he says to them in verse 26, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. What does it mean to hate our family members? Why would Jesus say this? I could never hate Carrie and my boys. I could never hate my sister or my parents. Or I, I, could, I could not hate these people. I love these people. And, and on top of that, we've got countless scriptures that tell us that loving them is the right thing to do, that we should love our neighbors, that we should love our family, our brothers and sisters, passages in 1 Timothy that specifically go out of their way to say that your greatest love should be reserved to those in your household and those who are part of your family. We've already looked at another verse this morning that says, if you hate these people, you're a murderer and you can't inherit eternal life. And so why would Jesus say, in order to be his disciple, we have to hate our families? I think that I think that what Jesus is getting at is an issue of worldview. You know, worldview is something that, that all of us have. It's the way that we view the world, right? It's kind of built right into the word there. It's just the way that we see things around us. And every one of us has a worldview. And often they are so deeply ingrained in who we are that we just don't think consciously about them. But our worldview is the lens through which we see everything around us. And in 
this passage, I believe what's happening is that Jesus is asking his followers to change their lens. See, Jesus sees the urgency of what lies ahead. And when, when there is such urgency, when there is such an urgent task to be done, everything else, including our possessions, our family, our own lives, everything else must be put at risk for the sake of the kingdom. When we change our current lenses out for the lenses of God's kingdom, everything has to change. According to this passage, when we begin to see the world through these new lenses, our possessions, our family members, our life itself pales in comparison to our commitment and our dedication to Jesus. Now, most of our worldview lenses, uh, when we look through them, we see our family relationships as the closest ones to us, the most important relationships in our lives. And what Jesus says in this passage in Luke, this difficult passage in Luke, is that in the network of relationships in which we all live, and we all have a network of relationships in our lives, and in that network, what Jesus says is that the gospel is not just a higher priority, but it actually must redefine all of the other relationships. What Jesus says in this passage is that the kingdom of God has to be the new lens through which you view every relationship in your life. It's the new worldview that he gives us. We cannot use the lenses that we naturally want to use if we want to be disciples of Jesus. We've got to exchange them for a new worldview. So I want to look briefly at the rest of this passage as Jesus tells uh, a couple stories to illustrate his point further. He says, For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he will send a delegation and ask for the terms of peace. And so therefore, Jesus says, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Jesus is asking simple questions with a singular theme. If you're going to build a building, don't you make sure ahead of time that you've got enough money and lumber and all the stuff you need. Before you build, you count the cost. If you're going to wage war, don't you make sure ahead of time that this is a war you can win. And if it's not, you figure out how to salvage it, right? Before you wage war, you count the cost. And and before you and I set out on any new thing, if we are wise, we plan accordingly. We decide whether we can do this or not. It's, It's not that we have to know every single surprise that may come. It's just that we don't schedule a three-week Mediterranean cruise, including a tour of Europe, when all we've got the budget for is one day at Cedar Point. This is kind of common sense stuff. And so the question that we ask at such a time is this question, does this cost more than I am willing to pay? And that is the question that Jesus was asking that big crowd to consider. And I believe that it's the same question that Jesus wants you and me to consider today. He doesn't paint a rosy picture. He doesn't say, if you, you, know, if you come to, to be part of this kingdom, it's going to be smooth sailing from here. No, that's not what he says at all. He says, if you want to be a part of this kingdom You've got to view your life through a lens that you've never considered before. You've got to view all of your relationships in a way that you've never viewed them before because the relationship that you have with me has to be not just the highest priority, 
but it's got to redefine all the other relationships that you already have. Jesus very clearly says in this passage that there are three things that exclude us from being his disciple. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. I hope you do too. And he really clearly articulates here three things that exclude us from that. If our love for our stuff is too great, if our love for our family is too great, if our love for our own lives is too great, so that the lens through which we see the world is not his, we cannot be his disciple. So following Jesus may cost you everything, including all of the things that you currently hold, that I currently hold as most dear to me. And the question that Jesus asks us today is, is that more than you are willing to pay? Would you stand with me and let's pray. Lord, this has not been an easy message to preach today because I really, really love my family. And if I'm honest, I really love my stuff and I really love my life. And I don't like the thought of, of having to let go of those things or hold them with open hands. But God, I also want to be your disciple. I want to follow you obediently. I want to see the world around me through the lenses that you use and not through my own. And so I pray today that you would help us collectively redefine the network of relationships in our lives. Not that we would abandon our families. (laughs) I think that's the farthest thing from what you want. But God, that we would be so deeply committed, so deeply dedicated to following after Jesus that everything else in our lives, including the things that we now love the most, would fade away because of our commitment to you. God, help us understand what you mean when you say we can't hate our brothers and sisters without being murderers, but we have to hate our brothers and sisters in order to be your disciple. Help us to grasp this difficult truth and to be willing to reorder our lives based on your invitation. Lord, may this not be too high a cost for us to pay as a community, I pray. And we thank you because you did not shy away from paying the highest cost so that we may have grace and mercy and forgiveness. And for that, we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. It's good to be back. It's great to be with you. God bless you. I love you. Have a great week. Thanks again.